Well, good to see you this morning. Somebody say amen. Hello. Praise the Lord. Got family here. Got my sisters in from Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. Camille's here. Got the Barbosas in all the way from China. Woohoo! <laughs> so, good to see everybody here. It's quite a great day in the Lord. You know, we're in our series of messages dealing with family foundation. This is going to lead us right up to our marriage retreat in a couple weekends from now, so you don't want to miss that. But as we're laying a groundwork, preparing for that aspect of family ministry, we're talking about these other elements of home and family and, and our relationships and what does the Lord desire. In fact, the, the subtitle here is Training Versus Raising Our Kids. Uh, you know, we're living in a, a, this is a, such a unique time, and that don't say that necessarily in the best way. But this is certainly a unique day in which we're living in. It's harder to raise our children probably than any other generation has had to deal with because all the technology and the culture and the, the power and the impressiveness of this culture. It's a difficult job being a parent this day and even being a grandparent. Uh, you know, as a parent, about the time you, 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 know, you, you, you get these kids and you don't know what to do with them, <laughs> you know, they're brought into your life. And, you know, about the time you're experienced at it, they leave home. So... <laughs> There's a learning process. Uh, in the world we're living in, there's a lot of especially confusing voices and opinions about, about family. In fact, today in America, the family has uh, lost uh, most of its impact and influence, given way to immorality and, and the cultural push away from God. So, I mean, we just celebrated, you know, the world celebrated Great Gay Pride Week. You say, oh, were you homophobic? I, no, I'm not, but I am a xenophobic. S-I-N. <laughs> a sin, you know, we shouldn't ever celebrate any sin. You know, and, and just like adultery or fornication, homosexuality is a sexual sin. The Bible makes it clear, you know, and I, I understand, back off, you know, we're, I'm politically correct as I need to be. I'm more interested in being biblically correct. And biblical correction says that we're all sinners and in need of the mercy and the grace of God. And then if we're in sin, it needs to be corrected. We, we can't use the excuse, well, that's just the way I was born. We're all born sinners, all right? But I have a solution. You can be born again. And through the name, power, and blood of Jesus Christ, your life can be eternally changed and transformed. You know, this is not about haters. This is about lovers. For God so loved a fallen and a sinful world that he gave his only begotten son so that you and I could be redeemed and changed and saved. So, well, I don't like that. Well... You know, your argument's not with me. I love you. Your argument's with God. So we want to come back to biblical blueprints and biblical foundations, you know, and find out what God says, especially in regard to our family. One man said, you know, but he had five theories and no kids on how to raise kids. He said later on he had five kids and no theories whatsoever left. And isn't that the way to go? But where do you go? I mean, in a day and an age like today, we're raising children. Where do we find the answers? Who, who is the model that we, we look to? Well, I think we understand in church that there's only one perfect role model, and that perfect model is God, that he is the model parent. In fact, the Bible says, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. So here we have a very clear standard given to us that we can have a model, and he doesn't make mistakes. And he's our heavenly father, and he sets the standard in us. And what we should learn from this is what Matthew's telling us is, hey, we have a righteous God, therefore it ought to be the goal, the desire, the passion in every one of our lives to be a righteous people. He said, you know, your goal is to be like your heavenly father. So the goal in, in raising children, the goal in our lives, ultimately in all these things is Christ-likeness. Even in parenting and being a husband, a wife, you know, that, that goal for your life really hasn't changed from no matter where you are and what stage you're at in your life. It's all about being like Jesus and letting Christ be seen in you and through you, that there's such a uniqueness about your life. Where does that come from? That only comes from us going back to our Heavenly Father. It is in the mind, in the heart, in the plan, and in the will of God for that to take place in your life. That's the goal of God. In Romans 8, it says, you know, God has predestined us believers to become conformed to the image of his Son. In 2 Corinthians, it talks, there's that great verse, as we all with unveiled face beholding as a mirror it, 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 the glory of the Lord, we are being transformed in the same image from glory to glory, just as the Lord from the Spirit. What's he saying? Jesus was the exact image, it says in Hebrews, 
of the Father. And now we're to be that same reflection of the Father and the Son that should be seen in our lives. So my goal, number one, as a man, as an individual, is like, to be like Christ. Yours as a woman, to be like Christ. Yours as a young person, to be like Christ. As parents, or even as grandparents, we have this responsibility to these generations of children to be what? First and foremost, to be like Jesus. That Christ might be seen in our lives and in their lives. That should be the goal for my children's life. Today, I want to deal a little bit more about in this family concept of dealing with our, our, our relationships within the family and with children. And I want to give you five things that I think will be real helpful. They're simple, but yet they're in their simplicity, they are profound. And I think that, if, you know, they may be things, well, I know this, I know this, but certainly it is good to rehearse it. It's good to hear it again. It's good to be reminded of it because these are important things that we're dealing with when it comes to our family and to our children. So we want to hear what God has to say to us and remember what God has to say to us and then to do what God has to say to us. Of the five things, the first would be this. I must, as a parent, understand my children. The scriptures tell us, as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him, for he knows how we are formed. You have to come to the place of understanding your children. Now, I know most kids' number one complaint is about their parents is they just don't understand me. Now, a lot of times that's a cop-out, all right? But I do believe there's an important truth in this that we do need to seek to realize that our kids are unique. You have one kid, he's unique. You have two kids, they're not the same, they're unique. You have three kids, four kids, they're all different. You can't put them in a cookie cutter. The Bible says that children are a heritage of the Lord. In other words, that God has given you these kids and are all kids alike? No. Do they all have the same strengths? No. Do they all have the same weaknesses? No. Are they all motivated the same? No. And the best thing that I can do as a parent is to ask God to give me insight into those children's hearts and minds and lives so I can see what they are. Where are their strengths and where are, what is that unique personality that God put in that little creature? Amen. To find out what the Lord says. In Proverbs, it puts it like this. Homes are built on the foundation of wisdom and understanding. Praise God that my Father, my Heavenly Father, is very understanding. And not just understanding being patient and putting up with, but understanding is knowing the keen way that I am built and the way that He has designed my life. There's that passage that's often quoted in churches in Proverbs 22. It says, train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he's old, he will not turn from it. Now, this is not necessarily a promise in as much as it is a proverb. There's a lesson that's being taught instill truth into your family, instill truth into your children, all right? But I, I do believe that it's a promise that if we have been done that, that we can base, you know, our prayers for our children on that. Some just translate it in that one way that, well, that means that you can tell them what's right and they leave home and do wrong. Ultimately, since you put right in them, they're going to come back to it. Well, I think it's important that you do instill the, the, the moral compass in their heart and life and the, the instruction from, from the Lord about who is God and who is Jesus and how much he loves us and how he has a purpose for our life and that we all need him and that we're all sinners but we can be saved by grace. Those foundational principles we want to put into our children's hearts. And ultimately, we believe that God will convict them and deal with them and draw them to the place of repentance. But there's something else, I think, that's in this passage that's often overlooked. You know, and when you read it from the Amplified Bible, it says you train up a child in the way, and it says this right after that to explain it because it amplifies the, 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 the Hebrew, in keeping with his individual gift or bent. Train up a child according to his individual gifts or his bent. Now, first of all, we all have bent to be sinners, all right? But it's talking about otherwise, personality-wise, character-wise, you know, their heart-wise, the uniqueness of them as an individual that you want, to, you want to realize just how God has fashioned them, what their temperament is, what their personality is, because each one of our children are unique. Each one of your grandchildren has a potential that's different from the other one. Each child needs to be understood on that basis. I mean, not every kid, you know, loves what you love. Not every, not every kid loves math. I never understood those that did. But anyway, not every kid does. You know, not every kid is going to be qualified for MIT or Harvard or whatever it might be. Not every kid, you know, you, you can't stand over your children and say, this is what you're going to be. You've got to find God's will. You've got to find God's purpose. You've got to discover what God's doing in that child. You can't stand up and make a declaration, well, my kid's going to be this, or my kid's going to be that. He's going to be just like his old man, or he's going to do what his mom did, or he's going to be a preacher. He, you know, you can't 
force children into these little molds that we have for them as parents. I think the idea is if you're working with wood and you're in a woodworking class setting and you're learning what it means to work with wood, you discover how important it is to work with the grain of that wood and so that it shows off its full potential and its full character. Understanding takes prayer, takes seeking God's face, takes time with your kids, amen? But prayer is important. But Proverbs 14, 26 says, that, but a man of understanding has patience. So ultimately it takes patience. If you're going to be the person of understanding, like God's a God of understanding, then the proof that we're that kind of parent is we're going to learn what it means to walk in patience with our children. Understand your kids. The second point is I must accept my children. Now, the key word here when I say accept my children, oh, I love my kids, accept him goes a little bit further than this. It's like Adam and Eve in the garden when God brought Eve and presented her to Adam you know, Adam said, you know, those most romantic words that were ever uttered by one man to another woman. What were they? You are now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. For this cause, a man shall leave his mother and his father and shall be joined together and they two shall become one. You say, that doesn't sound very romantic. Hey, what he was saying is this, I accept you. Everything you are or for everything you are. And really, that's what it gets to in marriage. When we, isn't that what we stand and we make these vows, you know, that in sickness, health, and, you know, everything until death do us part? It's, it's, a, it's a declaration. It's a, it's, a, it's a vow that, hey, of acceptance that I'll receive you so that if there are faults and failures, I still receive you. Isn't that the way God received us? Ephesians says in chapter 1 that we are accepted in the beloved. And that's the same kind of acceptance we have to, to demonstrate with, with our children. The Lord is, tells us in, in uh, Psalms 145 that he's gracious and he's compassionate and he's slow to anger and he is rich in love. Absolute acceptance. God accepts me. Now, that doesn't mean I'm going to go off and choose to live in my disobedience because he accepts me. I think the more I understand his acceptance, the more I want to be submissive to him and the more I want to love him. In fact, Romans, when it talks about this relationship, even in the church, is you accept one another. What does that mean? Some of you are weird. All right? Some of you think I'm weird. All right? But we accept one another. We're not all the same. We don't all have the same personality. We don't have all the same unique bends as the others do. But we've learned this attitude of grace and humility and patience that brings us and makes us stronger as the family of God. And it's the same thing in your own family. There's this attitude of acceptance. You don't say, I'm going to make every child like me. And if they don't meet my standard, well, I'm just going to shun them. No, remember, children are a gift from the Lord, that he gave them to you. But with that gift comes this responsibility to handle the gift he's given you with proper prayer and proper care. You didn't choose them. God put them in your family. But he put them there for a reason. Because he's going to give you as a parent and even as a grandparent what you need to minister to that child. So don't spend all your life or their life trying to make them like yourself. You need to be good in school because I was good in school. You need to be the best athlete because I was a great athlete. Or you need to be a great artist because I, you know, I, I was a great artist. And that's the way it should be in our family. Or you, know, that's a, you need to have the same sense of humor as I have. Or you need better at this or more of this. Or, uh, you know, what you're basically saying to each child is saying, hey, Eventually, if you want me to accept you or your mom to accept you, then uh, you're going you know, you know, to have to be more like me. I can't be like you. And we really missed the mark. I missed the mark about accepting them for who they are. Now, this doesn't go without understanding. The third element here is I must discipline my children. The whole idea behind discipline, remember, is not just actual punishment, but that's part of it. But it's also, you know, where you're just going to, 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 to chasten them. But there's a greater part of it, and that's the instructive part. And so when you're teaching children, it's discipline. When you're reproving your kids, it's discipline. When you're encouraging your kids with, with principles of Scripture, that's, that's a process of discipline. The Bible says, whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. In fact, it's, it's, my, it's my proof that I'm a child of God. I can't get away with anything. Amen? I just can't get away with anything. Most of your kids don't get away with anything, do they? I mean, some of your kids think you've got eyes at the back of your head. Because you just know as a parent when things aren't right, you know. Of course, they're, they're still young. They don't realize they're giving all these telltale signs everywhere. All right. 
you know, they just, it's obvious that they're getting, about to do something really dumb or really stupid or really bad and they're going to make a big mistake here. But, you know, it, it's your responsibility to be consistent and to discipline and to instruct them and to be that person, you know, that, that God, God's given them. It shows you love them. It shows me when I'm disciplined by my Heavenly Father that He loves me. In fact, if I'm without chastening, it says I'm not even a believer. In other words, if I can go do what I want to do and ignore God's call and purposes for my life and God's will for my life and just shun that and go do what I want, and I'm not disciplined by God, oh, you're probably saying I'm not a child of God. All right? So the Lord disciplines those whom he loves, so I should discipline those whom I love. In fact, Scripture tells us if you refuse to discipline your children, it proves you don't love them. Proverbs 13. Well, you know, I'm just not that kind of parent who believes in that kind of stuff. Well, let's see how your kids turn out. Because the Bible says it's going to be destructive to their life. If you don't participate, it says you're going to participate in their destruction. Discipline your children while they're young enough to learn. If you don't, you're helping them destroy themselves. It's a natural course of our sin nature. If it's not brought into check by our parents, it'll never be brought in check by God. You know? And what he's saying, you're just participating in the destruction. Now, here's where we fail sometimes. You know, we're living in this culture that's put this big, big deal out here about, you know, don't physically spank your children. You know, and this is the no spank culture. You know, we, we, don't, we don't physically discipline our kids. It's just time out. Man, I'd have loved that as a kid. <laughs> of course, I'd probably spent the whole day in time out. Time out. You know, what I needed was knockout. No. <laughs> Time out. Now, my mom had a, a little time out thing she used to do. If you, if you did, there were certain things if you did as, as one of the children in the family that was wrong. It, not, not everything required a spanking, all right? Some things had different kinds of discipline. You know, the, the, the crime met the time, so to say. You know, so some, at time out, where well, she chose time out was in the bathroom. That's not a fun place to spend 30, 40 minutes. You can wreck a bathroom in 30, 40 minutes, but there's no fun in there, all right? But there's a difference between what the world looks upon this idea and, and, uh, and, and what it means to, to discipline your children. I had a lady tell me before, she's adopted a couple of children in her family. She said, we had to sign documents that says that we would not spank our children physically. And she said, I don't know that we adhered to that real close. <laughs> but when they were at home, that, 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 that's the documents we had to sign. But the Bible doesn't say anything against that. In fact, it speaks in... in, 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 in in promotion of saying, hey, there are times when physical p punishment like that, I am like to use the word punishment, we'll see in just a minute why, the physical discipline like that is important. But there are some crimes that match that particular payment of sin, so to say. Now, in, in, when we're dealing with our kids as Christians, there's a big difference between punishing your children and disciplining your children. And we need to see the difference. Punishment really is a secular mindset, whereas Discipline, even though it may be applied to the lower exterior of the body here, it's, it is, there is a biblical discipline that deals with physical spanking like that. And they're completely different mindsets. And all too often, I think, we've let the world's mindset of what that means kind of creep into what Christian discipline really is. And some parents have embraced, in the church, embraced the world's mentality about what it means to discipline your children in this regard. Let me show you the difference here because there is a difference, all right? It's important you understand there's a difference between secular punishment and biblical discipline. The purposes are different, all right? But punishment is just to inflict a penalty. You did this, so you get that. This is what you did wrong. This is the price to pay for doing wrong. But with Christian discipline, the focus, the goal, the objective, everything begins to change now and say, you did this and... This is, this is, this is going to wreck your life if you keep up with that kind of habit and that kind of direction in your course of your life. So we're going now to use this situation, and we're going to promote maturity in your life and spiritual growth and right choices in your life. Here's the thing. We need to understand that even as Christians, when God chastens me, he doesn't punish me. You understand that? God doesn't punish me. Why? Because all the judgment for my sin, all the punishment for my sin has already been paid for. Jesus Christ took my place. Good King James word is my propitiation. He stood in my stead and took all my punishment upon me. Now what happens when I sin? He may discipline me. He's out to correct me. He's out to promote spiritual growth in my life. I'm going to know that something's going on. All right? I'm going to know that I've been touched by the hand of God in some way. 
But it's far different completely, the whole reason and purpose and the motive and the emotion even. All that's completely different. In secular punishment, you have the focus being the past and action of the past. But for the Christian, discipline's always about the future. It's not what you did, it's where you're going, where we move out from here. What's going to happen? How's, how's God going to do a work in your life from this place on? The attitude is different. With secular punishment, it's usually there's this attitude and this fierce emotion of anger, being upset, rage. You jerk them up by their arm. You spin them over your lap. You spank them real hard because they did that. But with Christian discipline, there's this different attitude. It's, it really is the attitude. This is going to hurt me more than it hurts you. Because I love you so deeply, I do not want to see you cry. And I don't want to see you suffer some pain here. I love you. But for your sake, and because I don't want to see you, you know, ruining your life by making bad decisions, something's getting ready to happen here to remind you that's not the choice that you need to make about in the future. The attitudes are different. The result, I believe, is completely different. The result from one is fear guilt, more anger from you, more anger from the child, more resentment versus security. Versus security. My mom and dad loved me enough to sit down and tell me when I was going to get a whip and what I was getting it for. And very clear what the right choices there and there about. You know, I think my kids would have rather had the whipping in that speech before the whipping. You know, where you set them down and in grace and patience and mercy you're speaking to their heart and speaking to their soul and to their mind and to their will, saying, hey, what you did was wrong, and this is the reason it was wrong. And if you kind of make those choices the rest of your life, that's where it's going to take you. This is what you're going to do now that is right, and here's what it's going to do in your life. But you can't do it, you know, in this attitude of anger and child shaking from fear. They're getting ready to get the daylights beat out of them, all right? At that point, a lot of times, you know, they get into this little performance kind of mindset and living, and one day it all just explodes. But when God disciplines you, he's being gracious to you. And when we discipline our children, it really is an act of graciousness. There's that passage in, in 1 John 14 says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out, drives out all fear, because fear has to do with punishment. We're dealing with discipline here. So biblical chastening, chastening does involve spanking. But the right way, the right attitude, the right emotion. Unless you're afraid of killing them, let me remind you, these little bottoms that God gives them, they're designed to handle it. They're all padded up with fat and that good stuff, you know. So they can deal with it. They can take it. They can handle it. But you need to be doing what you're doing in regard to disciplining them with wisdom. You say, well, Brother Joe, what's the proper way? I'm so glad. I, I knew you'd ask, so I put it up. First, calmly. Not because you're ticked off, you're going to give them a whipping. Not to relieve your own frustration. The Bible says in Proverbs 29 that a fool gives vent, full vent to his anger. Ephesians 6 puts it this way. Don't keep scolding, nagging your children, making them angry and resentful. Use, use loving discipline. Nagging doesn't work. That's, that's, that's not training. Next time you do that, I'm going to kill you. That's not training. Don't do it that way. Quickly is the second idea here. Don't delay. And, and listen, and don't do this. And you just wait till your father gets home. You know? Proverbs says, if you discipline your son, it, it proves you don't love him. That's a powerful statement, is it not? If you love him, then you're going to promptly deal with this issue of chastening and this issue of discipline in that child's life. Quickly. Don't put it off. Consistently is the third point here. Now, this is where a lot of parents, probably the, one of the biggest battles that you face is. I know as a parent I did. Just being consistent. In other words, if you spank for this offense today, then you're going to spank for that offense anytime it comes. You can't spank one day for this offense and then, you know, go sit in the corner for this offense. In other words, you need to have to decide between those in your home what the spankable offenses are you know where where is that line that you cross and what are the other offenses and what are hey there's plenty of other things you can do to get a kid's attention today in this day and age just take their ipad from them yeah it's like removing their heart <laughs> i'm gonna die without it i need my device 
I can't live without my device. Got to be consistent. You know, here's why we fail. We say, we say stuff like this. Hey, I told you not to do that. You do that again, you're in trouble. And they do it again. Didn't, didn't I just tell you if you did that again, you're going to get a spanking? Yeah. Well, don't do it again. And they do it again. Hey, can you hear me? I just told you. Third time now. You do that again, you're going to get a spanking. Okay, yes. Yes, sir, yes. Sir. yes. They do it again. This is where anger usually sits in. This is where you start acting out of order. Then you're ticked off. I can't believe you. Are you brain dead? And all the things you shouldn't say or said, all the things you shouldn't do or done, because you wouldn't be consistent. Because you wouldn't be true to what you're supposed to be true to. And what you've done is even more damaging because now you've taught your kid, hey, I can get away with this at least three times. Fourth time I'm in trouble, so I'll stop before them. And what you've done, you've trained your time, what we call fourth time obedience. Why don't you train them for first time obedience? You know? In fact, just sit down your kids today. You that have kids at home and say, listen, you know, I've got a great lesson in, in church today. You know, how to properly discipline you. And so from now on, I'm not going to do that to you anymore. I'll tell you second time, third time, fourth time. I'm just going to tell you once, and if you don't do it, then you're going to get a spanking. Anybody want to practice? <laughs> now, y'all laughing. We practiced, didn't we? We made our kids practice, all right? We taught that, didn't we? I mean, we, had a, we had a Raising Kids God's Ways class, and we, we practiced on our kids. Go home, tell them practice. We taught them how to interrupt this. Don't you come up and interrupt me. How many times, how many of y'all have kids interrupt you all the time? You're talking to somebody and the kids come in. Go ahead and raise your hand. Every one of y'all raise your hand, right? Grandkids come in. You know what y'all do? Teach them how to interrupt you. How do you, how do you interrupt mom? How do you interrupt dad? You just walk up to them while they're in the middle of the conversation. Don't say anything. Just put your hand on their shoulder. And we practice that. Me and Kathy would be talking. Okay, we're ready. Y'all come in when you're ready. We're going to talk. And they come put their hand on their shoulder. And then when we were finished with a sentence, we are told them we're going to finish this sentence. And then I'll tell you one thing or the other right then and there, and you just respond to what I tell you. And we'll come back to you in a minute, or just stay here for a second. We'll come back. We'll, we'll deal with it. But that's how you interrupt. Let's practice again. You know, how, how, how do we interrupt? Listen, this can be fun in reality, for you at least. <laughs> But it's a learning process, no matter what it is. But don't get in this thing of teaching them, that, hey, you can get away with this at the 10th time, and after that, you know, you better run for your life. In other words, let me put it simply. Do what you say you're going to do. Just do what you're going to do. Rebellion is manifest in kids all the time. And it's usually manifest in one of two ways. They're what we call, you know, active rebellion. This, this is what some of y'all here, I can just tell you, just been being your friend. You know, your defiance is direct. It's no mistaking. It's disobedience. It's talking back. It's refusal to accept whatever correction. I mean, you, you, you know how to tell your mama, ain't no way. You put your chin up. And, no. You know, I saw my brothers and sisters do that, older brothers. I knew that didn't work real well. So I went through this deal, the other, pa the passive resistance. Attitude, you know, not saying, not rejecting, just kind of defiant kind of look. Or pretending not to hear. You know, or when the real heat was coming down, that's when you went into the pleading mode. Oh, I'm so sorry. And my favorite, ignorance, all right? Ignorance always works. Don't get any ideas from this, kids, okay? Ign I didn't know. I didn't know that's what you meant. I didn't know that's what you want. And it's obvious I was just caught in what doing what I wasn't supposed to do. But boy, I was ignorant, you know. And, and here's what happens. If you don't correct this in your children... Let me tell you the kind of parents they grow up to be. And when I say these three words, you're probably going to think of adults you know like this. Sulking, pouting, and whining. How many of y'all know adults like that? How many are adults like that? <laughs> How'd you ever get that way? Because you weren't dealt with the way you need to be dealt with as a kid, so you didn't learn it, and you didn't mature in that area of your life, and everything just, you just pout about everything. Oh, you, nobody loves me. Nobody cares. Nobody understands me. Mama don't love me. Husband don't love me. Wife don't love me. Boss don't love me. You know, I mean, the garbage man don't even like me. <laughs> the rebellion has to be dealt with. 
Let's, let's move ahead. We, we, we've dealt with three of these things. Look at the fourth thing now. What else besides this issue of, 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 of much dysfunction? I must express love to my children. This is a, this is a constant, obviously, and it's just one we know. But let me tell you that we, we talked about this a little bit last week in, in, in relationships and dealing with family members about, about taking the time to help and to hug and to hear. It's the same three things. I just put them a little differently, but they're pretty much the same. So we don't spend a lot of time with them. But obviously, you can express love through, through affection. That's the touching. That's the hugging. That's the, that's the patting on the back. That's rubbing their head, you know. That, that's embracing them. That, that should be a constant. Psalms 145 says, the Lord has compassion on all those he has made. I just know the Lord embraces me. I've had times when I knew the Lord was embracing me or the Lord was encouraging me or the Lord was lifting me up. We know those times when the Lord just receives us. Unfortunately, you know, women are good at this, but men aren't so good all the time at this. In fact, studies have shown that men only hug about one-sixth as much as women do, as, as, as mothers are, show that affection. But fathers, listen, you might not have had a father who did this for you, but you need to be this kind of daddy who loves your kids, hugs your kids, kisses your kids. I still love and hug and kiss my kids today, and they're older than dirt. <laughs> Through affection, through affirmation, you know, the Lord upholds those who you know who 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 are down. You know, you, you you lift your kids up. You don't rub them down in the dirt when they're down the dirt already. All right. We talked about last week how funny kids can be, but you have to be, there's a thin line here of making fun of your kids when they're being funny. You know, you don't want to make your kids feel like you're mocking them for something really silly they did. You know, you want them laughing with them at something that happened. So be cautious and don't make fun of your kids. I mean, kids do funny things, but you learn to laugh and laugh at the right time, you know, or they'll think you're mocking them. And then when they, when they fail, you teach them, it's, you know, people fail. We talked about home last week being a place for, for security so that when they do face the rejection and the failures of the world, and they do face them, that they at home can find the place where they can be upheld and lifted and held on to and know that, hey, hey, you don't get to the end without failures. You don't win without failures. You don't have victories without some defeats in your life. The third thing was through attention. Psalms 145, 18. This was all these are for 145. Our Father is near when we call unto him. When's the last time you sat down and gave your kids just full attention? Back in the 90s, there was Cornell University that attached a microphone to children in their homes, and they found that the average father spent about 37.7 seconds a day talking to his children. Not just getting down there, looking them in the eye, listening to what they have to say, affirming them, spending time with them. That's the missing link in our culture today, in our society, and families today. It's just time together. I mean, even when you go to the restaurant, you go, you, when you go to, if you got to eat lunch today, you're going to sit down and you're going to see some families gathered on Sunday after worship. They're out there and they're all sitting at the table. And what are they all doing? Right? Everybody's got their little device. If you're going to have July 4th family time together, tell everybody to put their phone up. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Just turn the ringer off at least. You know? Just, just, just spend some time together. Spend some time. Uh, I don't want to talk about. Okay, let's talk about this. I don't think about it. Let me look that up on Google. <laughs> Let me go. Siri, what do you think about that? You spend more time talking to Siri than you do your mother. What's wrong with that deal? Plenty's wrong with that deal. All right? We're raising this delinquent generation because they're so preoccupied with stuff and things and technology and then money and pleasure and fame and it absorbs all their life and their time and their energy and just saps them dry. Next time you're out with friends, put your phones up. I've told you before, if you're out to lunch with a bunch of people, everybody put their phone in the middle of the table. First person to pick it up pays the bill. <laughs> Amen? We've done that with our family. First person picks it up, gets to pay the bill, and we stick to it. You know me, I'm too tight to pick my phone up. <laughs> I think too often we find it easier to give a device, a toy, a gift, than we do to give our time. One of the most expensive commodities is not an Xbox, not an iPhone. It's your time. You say, Brother Joe, how much time is needed? A lifetime. It's just a lifetime. And, you know, you need to learn how to, how, to, how to deal with that. The fifth thing, the last thing is important, like it is in discipline, we have to be consistent in all levels with our children. 
The Bible tells us in Psalms 24, 45, that the Lord is righteous in all his ways. We're always teaching. There's never a time when you're not teaching. No matter what age your kids are, there's never a time when they're not watching. There's never a time when they're not hearing. All your homes are bugged. Your kids are listening to everything. All right? And your kids can repeat everything. Some of you have been embarrassed by that. Because your kids repeated what you said to somebody you shouldn't have said something about. <laughs> oh, you're that uncle that's a lazy bum. <laughs> Mama said you were lazy. No, I'm sure that didn't happen to you. But the consistency, and, and this is true. I mean, my kids, you know, they, the kids by naturally are inquisitive. And when they're little, they're extremely inquisitive. They want to know what you're doing. They want to know what you're talking about. And when you're just you and your spouse are over here talking, guess what? They get quiet while they're playing because they want to hear what you're talking about. The house is bugged. If you go off to the bedroom to discuss something, they're on the other side with cups against the wall. <laughs> so how do you know? I was a kid. You were a kid. You want to hear what's happening? What's going on now at the church? What's happening over there? Somebody needs to tell me what's going on. I want to be on the know. Kids are like that. And that's why you have to be consistent. You, you can't be hypocritical. You, you, you've got to be faithful. You've got to, you, you, you just got to establish this, this, this element of having honor and being an honest person in your life and holding to honor. The Bible says in Proverbs 20, it's a wonderful heritage to have an honest father, an honest parent. What a heritage, what a blessing to have a father that was honest. And unfortunately, there's not a lot of people who get to experience that heritage of an honest dad, a dad who was genuine, a dad who was the real deal, a dad who didn't live in hypocrisy, a dad who didn't, you know, one, one thing in front of the family and another thing when he's away from the family. What a wonderful blessing, what a wonderful heritage to have a father that is honorable and that is honest. How do you do that? Again, I'm so glad you asked. One, simple, don't imply perfection. You're not going to be perfect, even if you're seeking to be an honorable father. But don't go around acting like you're perfect. Admit it when you're wrong. If you did the wrong thing as a father, as a mother, if you acted in the wrong way, if you responded in the wrong way, just be honest about it. Say, you know, that's not what I wanted you to see. Tell your kids that. I want you to see Jesus in me. And I didn't do that right. And I ask you to forgive me. I've had to do that with my children. I spanked them in, in, with all the wrong things and all the wrong ways and all the wrong reasons. I had to go in and say that to my son. Say, I, I didn't do that right. I didn't let him spank me back. <laughs> I think that's what he was hoping for. But just be honest. The second thing, keep your promises. The Lord's faithful to all his promises. I think one of the number one causes of bitterness in a lot of homes today and families is just these broken promises. Dad just didn't do what he said he'd do. Mom didn't do what she said she'd do. You know, Dad, you said we were going to go fishing. Or Mom, you said we were going to go to the mall, we were going to go shopping, and you didn't do it. Or the, the, this one thing you have to be really cautious of because it is when you say, when they ask you, can we do this? And you say, well, maybe. Now, you know in your mind, maybe means no. For the most part. You're leaning way over here in the no zone. Maybe. In their mind, it's just the opposite of that. They're moving over here towards the yes mark, where maybe means yes. And what happens when they're moving that way, expectations begin to arise. And the little minds can't always distinguish between that expectation of maybe and a yes. And they feel so distraught. So I think just be honest. Say, you know, I'm going to think about that. You know, and if we meet certain criteria, if this works, then we're going to do it for sure. But be ready in case we can't pull it off. We're not going to be able to pull it off. Just be honest. And when you know you're not going to, don't say maybe just because you want to, don't want them begging or something. Just say, no, we're not, do, we're not going to be able to do that. Because if you're always in this place where you're not doing what you said you'd do or thought they thought you were going to do, you know, then, you know, they're, going to, they're not going to feel you're very trustworthy. And in turn, in Sunday school, when the teacher reads out, Our Father which art in heaven, little kid's going to sit in the back and say, No, thank you. If anything like Daddy, he's not trustworthy. You know, the book of Malachi is the last book in the Old Testament, Right? And it's a book on, on God's people as God is inviting them to have revival. When the Spirit of God breaks out in them. He's telling them, he talks to them about their, their relationship to him. He talks to them about their stewardship and their finances. He talks to them about their marriage and the covenant they've made with their wife and being faithful to honor their covenants. And as they seek God, and that's the whole call, seek God. 
Be faithful to God. Come back to God with whole hearts and repent before God. And, and, and the last chapter closes out with, with these words, all right? The last verse says, And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. Now, that's real revival. When we have revival in our relationship with God that pours into our revival in our relationship in our families, that affects the revival that takes place in the church, which ultimately affects revival in the nation. God says, this, I, want to do something, I want to do something phenomenal. Well, my kids don't love me. God says, I can turn their hearts to you. My kids don't appreciate me. He can turn their hearts. My parents don't love me. He can turn their hearts to you. My parents don't understand me. He can turn their hearts to you. So what do we have to do? We just got to get right with God. You know, I hate to be oversimplified here, but you know, I'm a simple guy. You know, it's, it's get right. Get your hearts right with God. You repent of living the wrong kind of life and living for self and putting you first. And you get right with God, and he becomes first and foremost, and then everything else starts just falling into place. What do we need in America to happen? You know what we need in America to happen is that kind of move of God where he's working in people's hearts and lives, where we're coming back and we're submitting to our Heavenly Father. And guess what happens? As I'm submitting to him, my life has changed. And what's happening? All those little eyes and ears that are going on around me, all my children, they begin to see God doing something in me. There's a great principle in Scripture that talks about how we can have power in our life, you know, and victory in our life, and that when we speak, you know, it's, it's powerful and it's authoritative, you know, how the God, we want to teach our kids to live that kind of way, hey, you, you, you're walking power, you're walking in victory, but there's two words for, 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 for power in scripture, and one of them's translated uh, authority, all right, but it's a, it's a power word, and the other one is, is, is translated, it's a, it's a Greek word dunamis, which is like dynamite, which in other words, it, it, it brings impact, how do I have to be this person of impact? I submit to the authority of God. That's exousia in the Greek language. It means God's authority. I submit to God's authority in my life. And I get my life right with God. And the Bible tells me in Romans 13 that all authority comes from God. So I submit to him. And I submit to the authorities in my life. And in our home, we submit to the authorities in our life there. We just follow God's standard for submission. Ultimately submitting to God. Husbands and wives, submission to one another. Wives in submission to her husband. All right? Or it talks about that. I know it's hard for some, but you want authority, woman, in your life? As a woman of God, you want real dunamis authority? Then submit. As a man, you want real authority in life? Well, you don't have to say, I'm in charge around here. But when you speak, you don't have to say that because the charge is obvious, because you're under God's authority. We want authority in our life? Then we have to submit to God's authority and to the other authorities because it is caught. And if a father and a mother will not submit to Christ's authority in their life, they shouldn't expect their children to submit to theirs. I mean, where's the passion? Where's the impact? Where's the power? It comes from me being right with God. And it comes from you being right with God. And what happens, our kids see that. And they learn that lesson before they leave home. And it's not so hard for them to get right with God later on. But if we're sitting around just spouting out rules and regulations for our kids, but we're not submitting to the power of God in our own life, we're wasting our time. And we're just raising a bunch of rebels. Are you with me? This is a lesson for parents. It's a lesson for grandparents. It's a lesson for kids that we all get our hearts right with God and be what God's called us to be. What happens in return? This nation that has drifted so far from its foundation principles will begin slowly to move back to being where God wants us to be. But I can't expect the media, the government, I can't expect the humanist, the atheist, the public school systems, the universities, to make the difference that needs to be made. That kind of difference that needs to be made has to come from our hearts and our lives and our churches and our families. Then it pours into our communities, into our state, into our nation. We as a nation, we need to come to the place to repent. I have a video, just a real short clip I want to show you. And then I have a word I want to say to close this message out. If you're ready for that, go ahead and roll that. Got volume on it? 